Good morning, and um, thank you everyone for your interest in today's webinar. My name is Lisa Spiegel. And I'm Samantha Del Grafe. And today's presentation is called Back to Basics, Professional Staff Credentialing, Roles and Responsibilities. We have a few housekeeping um, notes that we're gonna start off with. First of all, we wanna remind everyone you've been placed into the webinar's muted mode. And we have a significant number of participants today. So we would kindly request you leave your lines on mute so all of our colleagues can hear the presentation clearly as we go through the webinar this morning. Uh, please note that our chat box is disabled at the moment, but we will be open for Q&A uh, towards the end of the presentation. In the case there, we, we do not have enough time for Q&A. We will connect with you afterwards via email. Please note that this presentation is provided as an information service and is a summary of current legal issues. This information is not meant as a legal opinion and viewers are cautioned not to act on information provided in this publication without seeking specific legal advice with respect to their unique circumstances. So to start off, uh, just run through the agenda, we'll be talking about in the context of privileging, credentialing, roles and responsibilities, the legislative and common law environment, which is how the law shapes this, this area. And we'll be starting with the primary legislation, the Public Hospitals Act, it's regulation 965 to the Public Hospitals Act called Hospital Management Regulation. We'll be turning briefly to some common law or judge-made law. And um, we'll be referring to hospital bylaws and the requirements around hospital bylaws. Um, that we call the legislative and common law environment. We'll then be turning to the notion of a credentialing policy, something we recommend. And we'll be turning to, at the end, disputes in respect of uh, action taken when there are disputes with respect to physicians or other professional staff um, at your organization and remediation. So to start with, as I said, the, the, the framework, the legislative framework around credentialing contains the Public Hospitals Act, Regulation 965, which is the hospital management regulation, common law, and bylaws. One of the key pieces of legislation that relates to the professional staff credentialing is the Public Health, the Public Hospitals Act, or the PHA. We will not be taking you through an exhaustive list or discussion of the sections in the PHA, but we would like to take you through some of the PHA's key sections. One of those key sections is Section 35 of the PHA. Section 35 establishes that every board shall establish a Medical Advisory Committee, or the MAC, composed of elected and appointed members of the medical staff. This is a statutory, statutorily required obligation, and a board must have a MAC. The MAC is composed of elected and appointed members of the medical staff as prescribed by the regulations. The MAC shall consider and make recommendations to the board respecting any matter referred to it under Section 37. The MAC shall also consider and make recommendations to the board regarding the appointment and reappointment of medical staff. The MAC shall also perform other duties as assigned to it under the PHA. Another important section in the PHA is Section 36, which covers the powers of the board regarding medical staff. Section 36 establishes that a board may appoint and reappoint physicians to a group of the medical staff, determine hospital privileges, revoke, suspend, or deny the appointment of or refuse to reappoint a member of the medical staff. The MAC and the board have a joint relationship where the MAC recommends and the board decides. The board is expected to take guidance from the MAC but the board is not there to act as a rubber stamp of approval for all of the MAC's recommendations. Again, the MAC is a required committee, whereas other subcommittees, such as a credentialing committee, are not mandatory. I want to turn to Section 34 of the Public Hospitals Act. While not related specifically 
or at all, to professional staff credentialing. This section of the Public Hospitals Act does relate to roles and responsibilities of certain medical officers at a hospital. And that is the reason I wanna highlight this section, which is slightly outside the, the framework of the presentation, but it does deal with roles and responsibilities of certain medical officers of a hospital. And section 34 provides different scenarios. One is where a hospital is not divided into departments. In that case, the chief of staff, or where there is no chief of staff, the president of the medical staff, which is a statutorily required position, elected position. So where there's no chief of staff, the president of the medical staff may be made responsible by bylaw to advise the MAC with respect to the quality of a medical diagnosis, care and treatment provided to patients of a hospital. The section also provides where in hospitals that do have medical departments, the head of each department may be responsible through bylaw with that chief of staff, or again, if there is no chief of staff at the hospital, then the president of the medical staff. So together the department chief and either the chief of staff or the president of the medical staff may be responsible by bylaw to advise the MAC with respect to medical diagnoses, care and treatment patients. Where a hospital deems the responsible medical officer, um, whoever the hospital deems, the responsible medical officer, um, there's particular duties that are ascribed where a serious problem exists in the diagnosis, care, or treatment of a patient. In those cases where there's a serious problem, that medical officer will discuss concerns with the attending physician if possible. If changes to care are not made promptly, that responsible medical officer or delegate they're permitted to delegate, delegate, but the buck stops with that responsible medical officer. That person must assume care for a patient and notifying the attending physician that he or she must cease having privileges for that particular patient. This section also provides for required reporting of this action to the MAC, the hospital administrator, and the board. So it's an important section to be mindful of. Section 37 of the Public Hospitals Act, and, and I will say that the, the Public Hospitals Act is a relatively short piece of legislation. So those involved in credentialing should, should have it at the ready. Um, and it's very important that process be followed, um, as you'll hear me say probably from time to time throughout this presentation. But Section 37 is really the heart of the appointment and reappointment process. First off, it provides that any physician in Ontario is entitled to apply and reapply for privileges and appointment at a, at a hospital. And, and that's an important point. Um, while there is recruiting that goes on um, and someone may not be the desired candidate, anyone is entitled to, to apply for privileges and the same procedural requirements and procedural fairness are, ex are, 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 expect are expected. And I'll, and I'll go through what those are. First off, the MAC is required to make a recommendation in respect of the application received or reapplication um, within 60 days of a completed application. There is a provision in Section 37 to delay making that recommendation if one cannot be made within that 60 day time period. If there is that uh, requirement to delay making a recommendation, one must do so with reasons in writing to the applicant and to the board. When there is a recommendation made, notice must be made of that recommendation to the applicant. The physician has a right to receive reasons for that recommendation. They also have a right to a hearing before the board. After they receive the reasons, they may request a hearing before the board in respect of that recommendation. Both the request for reasons and the request for a hearing must be made within a specific time frame set out. And so when, I, when there is what I'll call a negative recommendation, so something other than what the applicant is seeking, when, when that recommendation is made by the MAC, before this goes to the board for consideration, one has to make sure that those time provisions are adhered to. So they have given notice of that recommendation. They have advised the applicant or reapplicant that he or she may request reasons. Um, and if that time period passes without requesting reasons, it can go to the board. 
If they request reasons, you must wait an additional seven days for them to request a hearing. If no request for a hearing is made, again, it may go to the board. If a request for a hearing is made, it goes to a board hearing, which I'll speak to later on. Um, after a board hearing, a board will render a decision um, in respect of the privileges or appointment. And the uh, physician has a right of appeal to that board decision to a body outside the hospital called the Health Professions Appeal and Review Board or HPARB. HPARB's hearing process is actually what's called a hearing de novo, so an entirely new hearing. So physicians who are effectively denied privileges at a hospital have a right to uh, challenge that denial by the board to an entirely new uh, tribunal, again called HPARB, where an entirely new hearing gets to take place. HPARB decisions are also subject to appeal at the Divisional Court, which is Superior Court of Ontario. Um, that's not a new hearing, that's that's an appeal, which is a, which is basically a, a motion where evidence is um, discussed and argued and the decision is, is contemplated, but it's not a whole new hearing. So while we hardly covered all of section, uh, sorry, all of the Public Hospitals Act, we covered some salient provisions. And I now want to turn to Regulation 965 to the Public Hospitals Act. Again, this is a very important piece of legislation, this regulation, and I would suggest those involved in credentialing um, are familiar with this, as uh, I would suggest, you know, chiefs of staff and people with responsibilities at hospital to, to uh, deal with credentialing and privileges. They should be familiar with 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 this regulation. Um, Section nine six five requires that the board shall ensure that the administrator establishes a system for ensuring the disclosure of every critical incident to the MAC, the administrator, and a patient or the estate trustee of a patient. The board also has responsibility um, for ensuring that the administration sets up a system to analyze the incident and develop a plan to avoid or reduce the risk in similar situations. And that's the sections that I'm speaking to at sections two bracket four and two bracket 5.1 with respect to critical incidents. There's other responsibilities set out in regulation 965 in respect to the board. That's one of them. The MAC also has responsibilities as set out in regulation 965. First of all, as Smith alluded to earlier, as set out in pub the Public Hospitals Act, the MAC has responsibilities to make recommendations to the board. Here, the regulation gets specific. The MAC may make recommendations to the board concerning, among other things, the dismissal, suspension, or restriction of hospital privileges. They may, may make recommendations to the board pertaining to the quality of care provided in the hospital by professional staff. Now I'm using the word professional staff here and not medical staff. That's because regulation 965, unlike the Public Hospitals Act, contemplates the privileging of regulated health professionals that are not just physicians, but that include dentists, nurses in the extended class, and midwives. And that I will be referring to as the professional staff. The MAC is to make recommendations in respect of bylaws pertaining to the professional staff and the clinical and general rules respecting the professional staff. The MAC is also required uh, and has the responsibility pursuant to Regulation 965 to supervise the practice of medicine, dentistry, midwifery, and extended class nursing in the hospital. They have the responsibility to advise the board on any matter referred to the Medical Advisory Committee by the board. They are required to report in writing to the board at regularly scheduled meetings of the board respecting the practice of medicine at the hospital. And they are to identify systemic or recurring quality of care issues in making its recommendations to the hospital's quality committee. And that comes through the legislation called ECFA. Section... Referred to as ECFA. Sorry, sorry, this is Section four of regulation 965 of the PHA establishes that the board shall pass bylaws pertaining to 
criteria for appointment and reappointment of members of the medical staff, procedures for board appointments of chief of staff and department chiefs, establishment and duties of medical staff committees, criteria for appointment and duties of dentists, midwives, and extended class nurses where applicable, the establishment of one or more committees of the medical staff, including the duties and powers of such committees to assess credentials, medical re records, patient care, and infection control, among other things. This certainly is not an exhaustive list. In addition to the statutory obligations, the board also has common law obligations. The common law obligations of the board are established in case law and evolve over time. The board has a common law duty to appoint professional staff who meet the needs of the community, effectively utilize the resources of the hospital, are skilled and experienced, will work as an effective member of the healthcare team, are collaborative, respectful, follow rules, ensure patient and safe staff safety. In the next few slides, we're going to take you through some of the case laws. Um, these are just a few key pieces of the relevant cases that we thought would be important to highlight for you, but this is certainly, again, not exhaustive and there is much case law in this area. Um, one of the first pieces of case law that we wanted to bring to your attention was the case of Rosenheck um, and Windsor Regional Hospital. 2009, where a hospital board has fiduciary duty to ensure it's, it effectively credentials physicians in accordance with the terms of the PHA, any hospital governing bylaws and patient safety. The quality of care provided at a hospital and patient safety must be of paramount concern to a hospital board when making a decision regarding physician privileges. As stated in SOAR McCunn at paragraph 16, ensuring patient safety in the provision of hospital services is a main purpose of the Public Hospitals Act, and that is to be balanced against the interests of the physicians who come before the board. And in Calia v. Blue Water Health 2014, the hospital, the hospital has a legislative duty and responsibility to act on those concerns. These duties and obligations are reflected and enforced through the hospital's policies and the bylaw. And I, I would just stop before we go to the next slide and, and note that um, when we look at the Public Hospitals Act and in light of these, these case laws, these, these particular passages in case law and others, there is the lens through which we look through the Public Hospitals Act is a public purpose lens, and a public protection lens. And it's an important one to understand the responsibilities required of the board and, and the MAC. The importance of the role of the hospital board in selecting its medical staff to ensure high quality of care is summarized in the case of Ree Sheraton and North York General Hospital. The selection of the medical staff is the single most important exercise of the authority of a board of governors of a public hospital. The composition of its me medical staff predetermines the quality and quantity of health care produced by the physical resources of a public hospital. Clearly, the selection of a medical staff is an art, the development of which arises out of a long study and continuous involvement with the practice of medicine in a hospital. The chief of staff, the chiefs of departments, and the medical advisory committee exercise this art when they consider the education, new and special skills, and the personality traits of a physician applying for appointment to the medical staff of their hospital. The recommendation of the Medical Advisory Committee to the Board of Governors to accept or refuse an application. And sorry, my arises from a professional medical evaluation of how well the attributes of the applicant will satisfy the requirements of the hospital. The Board of Governors of a public hospital must question and test this value judgment thoroughly in the light of its objectives to meet the healthcare demands of its community and always be satisfied that the applicant has been dealt with fairly and justly. 
Um, and this case continues into our next slide where it discusses the role of the MAP and its joint relationship with the board. The most cognizant source, cogent, cogent source of medical expertise relevant to the practice of medicine within a hospital is to be found in its medical advisory committee and chief of staff. A board has every justification to give great weight to their advice. However, a board of governors must not permit itself to become the rubber stamp of approval for proposals made by its medical advisory committee. No member of a board of governors ought to feel uneasy or embarrassed to question the basis of a proposal of the medical staff. Every board member owes a duty to its community to require that the advisors of his board demonstrate that they have given full and fair consideration to the issues and their recommendations support the established policies and objectives of the hospital a board is in breach of its trust to the public if for selfish motives it permits any individual or group involved with the operation of its hospital to deviate from those objectives or distort those policies and so again, while that's very, uh, relatively speaking, old case law, um, it's very much current principles. So the, the case is, is from a long time ago, but the principles still stand today. Um, we talk, Samantha talked about um, what the bylaws must include as per uh, regulation 965 in terms of credentialing. And we want, and because now um, we were talking about regulation 965, and now I'm gonna turn to the bylaws. I'm not gonna go over what she said, but I will say that regulation 965 also adds other components to what bylaws must include. And that pertains um, to the following in addition to, to, other, to other areas as well. One is procedure for the election or appointment of members of the board, various officers of the board and their functions and responsibilities, various committees of the board, if any, and their membership functions and responsibilities, as well as the functions and responsibility of an administrator. So it is important when crafting bylaws, and the reason we're highlighting this is um, one must have regard to the requirements that are to be contained in your bylaws, and those are found in Regulation 965. Bylaws can, can address other issues as well, but they must at a minimum address the things that Regulation 965 says they must address. I want to turn to the notion of a comprehensive credentialing policy. Um, the notion of a policy, unlike the notion of a bylaws, is not something that's statutorily mandated. It's not required that a hospital have a credentialing policy. It is, however, our recommendation that the ho hospitals do have a credentialing policy. Um, and and there's, there's a variety of, of reasons for that. Um, First of all, the policy, if a hospital does institute a credentialing policy, it's a board policy. Um, and what we have been doing in the last many years is removing from bylaws much of the content that used to exist and putting it into a credentialing policy, which is easier to revise, still is a board approved policy. The bylaws would still have reference to the credentialing policy. So where the bylaws, for example, are required to address the um, criteria for appointment and reappointment of professional staff. What we have been doing in recent years is referencing there's a credentialing policy in the bylaws and actually putting the specific criteria for appointment and reappointment in that credentialing policy. So effectively incorporating it by reference into this policy. Um, one of the reasons that we do recommend a policy as a standalone document is this notion, I mean, I'm, I'm often asked by boards, how do we know we're not rubber stamping? How do we avoid rubber stamping an MAC recommendation? And the answer that I'll give is that, first of all, as, as the case law demonstrated and, and set out, there is a tremendous amount of responsibility um, that uh, and deference that ought to be given fairly to the MAC who have the expertise to, to make these recommendations to the board. But the board needs to know that the MAC, and if there's a credentialing committee before the MAC, that the credentialing committee is following process, that they're thorough, that they have followed a process that the board itself has set out, 
Um, and, and that process would be set out in, in detail in a credentialing policy that the board would pass and develop along with the MAC. Um, and so having a policy, ensuring the board that not only do you have a policy, but people are trained in the policy, and not only are people trained in the policy, but people follow the policy, and by people I mean the MAC and the Credentials Committee, the board should be reasonably assured that the recommendations that they're getting from the MAC are based not only on expertise, but based on following a rigorous policy every single time, where they know that references are looked at if that's set out, which it should be, if uh, that they know that um, certain pieces of information are obtained from the person applying because it's set out in that credentialing policy. So when we put together policies, we address the duties and responsibilities related to applications, both new applications and renewals. Those applications and renewals are appended to the policy um, that, we, that we tend to put together. It sets out, of course, the criteria for appointment and reappointment. It also sets out, as might a bylaw, the midterm action and how and when midterm action can be taken. I'll be talking about midterm action a little bit later. Um, there are ways in that credentialing policy to ensure and monitor the quality of care to minimize risks to patients. For example, the policy might talk about uh, procedures for ongoing reviews during each year or at the end of each year, um, maybe uh, by the, the chiefs of department. And of course, the policy um, you know, we don't have a single policy that would apply to every organization. It would be responsive to each hospital's organizational structure. So some hospitals have credentialing committees, some do not. Um, you know, there's there's some are small, some are large, some have departments, some don't. So of course there there would be it would each policy must be tailored to the organizational structure. I want to turn now to appointment disputes. These are things that um, every hospital tries to avoid um, and may be successful year after year, but then eventually something arises. And so um, one needs to be aware of, of, of this particular provision in the Public Hospitals Act and how one might work through um, disputes. First of all, as I said, um, when a physician um, challenges a recommendation made by the MAC. The Public Hospitals Act, which only deals with physicians, as I as I said earlier, will set out what a board hearing might look like, and they set it out in in pretty general terms. But there's some conditions, and there's some requirements. First of all, the parties to that board dispute, where the board members become adjudicators at tribunal members making making findings. The parties before them are the MAC and the physician. There may be others as well if the board chooses. Um, that's very rare. As I said, the directors become tribunal members. So they, they um, an important provision of any tribunal is that they're objective. Um, and so they cannot come into um, as triers of fact or as tribunal members having prejudged an issue. And for that reason, um, any investigation that takes place in respect to a physician can't be done or shared with, done by or shared with board members. Um, and and they'll, they'd have to understand the reason for that is if this turns into a board hearing where you become an adjudicator, you have to have um, some objectivity, and it's specified in the Public Hospitals Act that you can't have been taken part in the investigation. So it is an adversarial process, unlike an MAC meeting, which can be adversarial in, in at times, but isn't meant to be an adversarial process as we understand that term in law. Um, an MAC um, meeting is simply that, a meeting of physicians, whereas a board hearing turns into a, a mini trial, effectively, or not not necessarily a mini one, um, depending on the issue. The burden in the board hearings rests with the MAC. I said there were two parties, principally the MAC and the physician. The burden rests with the MAC. Here's why, board, you ought to accept the MAC's recommendation is effectively what the MAC is trying to to um, 
to, to, to get through to the board. And it would be through calling of evidence, cross-examining witnesses, et cetera. It can also be done through a paper record if that's agreed, but typically it's done with, with witnesses. Um, where the board, because they may not be lawyers, and even if they are, may not be lawyers in the health space, um, would typically get an independent counsel to give them legal advice. So the MAC would have its own counsel, the, the physician would typically have its own counsel, and so would the board, simply to get legal advice um, as, as they go through this adjudicative process. As I mentioned, an appointment dispute before the board may go be appealed to HPARB. Um, in, in that particular case, the board then becomes the party before HPARB, and of course the physician is the other party, and HPARB is outside the hospital, they are an independent tribunal. They also can't have taken part in the investigation, but the chance of that happening are slim to none. So that's, but, but the, the same remains true. They're meant to be objective. There's different times when action can be taken against a physician if there's a view that their physician may not be suitable for privileges at a hospital. Um, and, I, and I'm going to stop for a second and say I've been speaking about physicians. As I said a couple of times, the Public Hospitals Act really only addresses physicians. It doesn't address other professional staff that may be credentialed at your hospital. One's bylaws, however, would address that. And aside from going to HPARB, which is not permitted if, unless you're a physician, the same process for um, that, that I went through about um, an MAC recommendation and a board hearing may well apply in accordance with your bylaws to nurses in the extended class who are credentialed, to dentists who are credentialed, and to midwives who are credentialed. So um, while the Public Hospitals Act only deals with physicians, your bylaws may expand beyond that when it comes to appointments and reappointments. There is, um, so there are different times when action can be taken if there's a concern about the professional staff remaining or becoming a, a member um, of your hospital professional staff. And one time is at renewal, okay, or at the initial appointment stage, of course. And um, there are sort of three buckets of areas where, where it might be justified not to renew or not to grant the appointment and privileges. One is, um, when, of course, there's a competency issue or there's a concern in respect of the quality of care. Another is when there's no human resource need or resource availability. So the hospitals might have or ought to have an annual human resources plan, setting out um, what their recruitment goals are, what their needs are. Someone may apply on a, on a cold basis and there may simply not be um, any resources for that physician. That's another justifiable ground. Uh, to, to deny privileges. And a third sort of bucket, um, if, if you think about it that way, a, a category of, of where a physician may not be granted privileges or may not be renewed, is when there's collegiality or disruptive behavior that's presented. The College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario has defined disruptive behavior um, as any inappropriate words, action, or inaction by a physician that interferes with, or may interfere with, the physician's ability to collaborate, the delivery of quality care, or the safety or perceived safety of others. Importantly, disruptive behavior may be demonstrated through a single act, so some egregious act, or more commonly identified through a pattern of events. There is um, a, a good body of case law that's developed that talks about the relationship between patient safety and collegiality. Um, not all very incidents, of course, of non-collegial conduct um, will be a risk to patient safety, but it's a slippery slope and it should be considered um, as a risk as you, as you look at the behavior of physician and, and, and assess the, the, the risk involved. So um, for midterm action, there should be an elevated risk. If you're going to be taking midterm action, whether on an immediate basis or a non-immediate basis, um, depending on what your bylaws allow, the, the time to do that is when there is an elevated risk. You don't want to wait to reappointment. You need to deal with it sooner than reappointment. And that's when 
patient safety or staff safety has become an issue. And there is an immediate risk involved, certainly when you're taking midterm action on an immediate basis, that requires extreme action, which could include the suspension of, of physician's privileges. And th the reason you take it is that you need to accommodate that risk. You need to address that risk. You can't wait till tomorrow. Um, something needs to be done. There are provisions that would be set out in bylaws. Um, if your bylaws allow it, you can do it. If they don't, um, well, you should, you should ensure that your bylaws do allow it um, to take midterm action in, in certain circumstances where there is risk and there's no lesser action that can be taken. And again, that might include suspending the physician. There are one's bylaws ought to contain procedural protection for the physician if, if this happens, such as a very uh, quick uh, time between the the date interim action is taken, so that suspension is taken, and the date that the MAC receives that information, so that they can effectively ratify that suspension or or say no, this doesn't seem justified in these particular circumstances. So, um, you know, and, and there are other procedural protections involved when midterm action is taken, such as the physician being entitled to attend a meeting of the MAC. Um, usually, that would be in one's bylaws. That ought to be in one's bylaws. Um, and um, they may be entitled to have legal counsel represent them at that meeting, which would not be the case uh, when you're dealing with renewal. Typically, the MAC would deal with that um, independent of a physician attending, independent of a physician attending with counsel. While I've talked about midterm action being taken in accordance with the Public Hospitals Act or in accordance with bylaws, You'll hear me call and ask me for advice to ask you questions about whether this can be dealt with by resolution first. Because once you take these steps that uh, are, are set out in the Public Hospitals Act and your bylaws for midterm action or even non renewal, you're getting into potentially um, a very adversarial process. Um, you're getting into uh, you know a level of uncertainty because there's of course hearings involved and appeals and. And you're getting into um, what may be quite uh, damaging for a physician as well in terms of their ability to, uh, you know, be able. Though they're going to effectively have a record that stays with them for their lives. And so, um, for, for for those reasons and others, it's all, it's important to think about: can I can I deal with this informally? Um, can I deal with this before we engage the Public Hospitals Act and our bylaws? And you're you should have policies at your hospital that would address. Um, issues of complaints, potentially issues of harassment, um, and and how to informally uh, resolve or even formally, but be, uh, resolve these actions. Um, and and one way to do that could be through way of an undertaking um, or agreement with the physician. That you'll want to consider in determining can we resolve this? Can we remediate? Um, what the nature of the issue is, right? Has is this been a repeated behavior or is this a singular time? Is there prospects for remediation, or have we tried that and 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 has it's not succeeded, or are we confident that there's no insight um, on the part of the physician such that embarking on remediation is probably futile? Those are the kinds of things you're going to want to consider before you determine is it even possible to do this by way of a resolution, or should we just go to the Public Hospitals Act and our bylaws? Um, and 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 those things require discussion. They also require looking at the record you have. What has been done? You may have a circumstance where the straw has broken the camel's back, so to speak, with a disruptive physician, but there's no record of any history of that physician being disruptive. There's just anecdotes. You're in a different scenario there than if you have um, a history for that's that's either thick or thin, but a history of recorded concerns. So you really want it. There's no one situation that will be treated the same way. You want to look at it comprehensively to make the determination of what's best. When I talk about remediate, when I talk about reconciliation or agreements, um, I certainly don't suggest compromise. At the end of the day, as I stated, um, the, the the patient's safety and staff safety are of primary importance, and so there can't be a compromise to that. But there can be more than one way to address an issue of concern. Whether it requires things like, for example, supervision, summary training, mentorship, those are things that ought to be considered 
Um, you know, I will always suggest that it's encouraged that the physician or professional staff retain counsel. Um, often counsel can be uh, extremely in helpful to the process um, in, first of all, explaining to the physician who's on the other side of the issue um, what their rights are, also what their what the reality looks like for them, and um, can help educate them to making the best decision for them. Um, and of course, in, in circumstances where they don't want to agree to anything, they can, they can act as an advocate, but they should be um, in, in an advocate in an adversarial process, they're always going to act as an advocate, but they should be encouraged, in my opinion, to to retain counsel um, in, in these circumstances where their privileges are at stake because there's significant implications to the physician um, when their privileges are at stake. Um, there may be an opportunity when we have issues of, one thing I haven't talked about is issues of capacity. So whether that's um, mental health issues or addiction or physical capacity issues, there may be an opportunity to, to address what those, how, how we can, um, instead of taking a punitive response to those, um, to those issues, uh, perhaps the, the physician can be encouraged to, to get help, to get into the right program, to get the treatment he or she needs, um, and, and, uh, we, we will often recommend the PHP um, for, which is the Physician Health Program, for physicians in circumstances of that nature or something equivalent to the PHP. The PHP, for those that don't know, is a program that is supported by the Ontario Medical Association um, and it does uh, involve doing psychological, psychological or psychiatric assessments, addiction assessments, et cetera. It doesn't need it to be the PHP as a way to go when those issues arise, but they certainly have expertise in that area and can be quite helpful in advising the hospital that, um, you know, that, that, that there's no issues of concern without advising the hospital what the specific issues were, but they can give confidence to the hospital as they do to the CPSO that, um, this person's being monitored, we think that they're safe to return to practice, or we think they're safe to return to practice under these conditions. And so there, there is a great deal of reliance historically on PHP uh, reports and opinions, um, and they, they do work in concert with hospitals and with the regulatory colleges. Nurses have their equivalent uh, to the PHP as well. So I should have opened up the chat to questions earlier, um, but I'm happy to do so now. So um, if if anyone has a question, you can put it in the chat box. Um, if we're able to answer it now, both in terms of the content and the timing, we will. Otherwise, I will happily get back to you. So we're going to give it a couple minutes. Questions? The, the chat box is in the bottom corner of your screen. If you have any questions, feel free to type them. We just saw one. I think I, I saw a question, but it went in and out. I think the question is, are your slides available? Um, the answer is yes, that they will be available and we'll be sending them to those that have um, participated. If that wasn't the question, I apologize. <laughs> Please ask it again. It didn't seem to stay. Um, so here's my email for those of you that don't have it. Give an example of a credentialing policy. Yeah. Um, I don't have an example of a credentialing policy. Um, we we have um, we have uh, done credentialing policies for multiple hospitals. Again, no two look the same. Um, but I'm happy to discuss with you what, what might work for you. Um, someone asked about reference checking as part of the process in credentialing. Um, we didn't talk about in this presentation the types of things that should be part of the process for credentialing. Um, but absolutely is a reference check as part of that. And, and not only is a reference check part of it, what we like to suggest and recommend is that references be obtained by certain individuals. Um, so, for example, some, some hospitals will say three references, but I don't think a reference from 
you know, someone's neighbor or best friend is, 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 is significant or it's important or can be relied upon the same way that a reference from a former chief of staff or a former department chief is. And so we like to specify that references should come from at least the following people with certain, um, uh, certain roles and those would include, for example, the former chief of staff or the former department chief. So you can get, um, you know, a fair assessment and um, just to go on a little bit more, whether or not one calls for a reference is is um, that the practice will vary. I think you need to see what that reference looks like and not only what it says, but as probably many of you know on this call, what it doesn't say. And there's times when you're going to want to make a call and there's times where you feel confident with the information you have. I, yes, the session will be available to rewatch later. Um, all our presentations, in fact, are on our portal on the, um, there's a health law portal at the Miller Thompson website. So you can navigate that and we can, we can send it to you as well. So um, you can read it, but I appreciate there's more content in what we've said um, than, than what we've put in writing. So yes, you can rewatch it. Um, and if you have trouble finding it on the website, let me know and I will um, get that information to you. Someone wrote, not a question, but great presentation. So thank you for the feedback. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, if anyone has any other questions, um, we're happy to, to answer them. Feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, we are taking a summer hiatus um, with our Coffee Talk presentations, but we will be back in the fall with more from our Back to Basics series. And if there's no other questions, I think we will ended a couple minutes early and thank you very much for joining us this this morning